Hi, so today we should speak about the biochemical aspects of kidney functions. I think you had already two lectures from physiology, yes? So, I will tell you something more about it. Sometimes I will repeat the knowledge that you already know. So, what are the main kidney functions? Excretion. What? Excretion. Excretion of what? Metabolic waste. Yes, so excretion of metabolic waste products. What else? Excretion of hormones. Excretion of? Some hormones are excreted there also. Yes, for example, insulinase is very active in kidneys, that's true. Acid-based balance. Acid-based balance and? Yes, kidneys have a role in blood pressure regulation. What else? Maintaining homeostasis. Yes, you know homeostasis is a very wide term. Homeostasis is everything, yes, to keep the proper glucose balance, urea balance, ammonia balance, the normal blood pressure. So what balances kidneys keep? So water balance, then? Acid base balance and. So they have some gluconeogenesis? That's true, but the third balance that's connected with water? Salt. Salt, yes. It means electrolytes, yes. So we can say that kidneys, their main function is to keep three balances in the body the water balance, it means the stable amount of water in the body. Then the electrolyte balance, it means to keep the proper amount of all ions in the body, or, or, or almost all, yes, ions in the body, and then the acid-base balance. It means to keep the proper amount of hydrogen proteins, yes? The second important function is to excrete the waste products of the metabolism. They excrete plenty of sulfates, phosphates, plenty of nitrogen waste products as ammonia, urea, creatinine, uric acid, yes? Kidneys are a very important uh, endocrine organ. In kidneys you produce three hormones, or at least three. Erythropoietin, calcitriol, and the third is? Renin. Renin, yes, angiotensin is the part of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, but in kidneys you produce renin. Renin is both, you know, according to the name, if you look, so renin is... Ren, renin. So this ending in means that it's enzyme, yes? But now we know that renin has its own receptors. We also have antagonists of these receptors, as for example, aliskiren. So in the old books you can read that renin is not a hormone, it's only enzyme that destroy angiotensin or giant angiotensin. But now we know that renin is hormone itself, or it has its own receptors that regulate the blood pressure. Yes? So renin is enzyme and also hormone. And the fourth main uh, function of kidneys is the role of kidneys in intermediary metabolism. You have already said that in kidneys takes place some part of gluconeogenesis during starvation, but in kidneys there's very intense metabolism of almost all amino acids. In kidneys you can produce, for, for example, creatine and also carnitine, yes? So there are four main functions of kidneys to keep the three balances. Water balance, electrolyte balance, acid-base balance, then to excrete waste products, to produce hormones, and the last function is its role in biosynthesis. And if everything it works, then we have this nice orchestra. How many neutrons we have in kidneys? One million. One million, so you see that here we have only lack of them. To do these four functions, kidneys have some functional units. Yes, we have three main functional units in kidneys. The first functional unit is renal corpuscle. 
that consist of the glomerular capillaries and of Bowman's capsule. This is the place of glomerular filtration. Then we have renal tubules. In tubules we have two processes, tubular resorption and tubular secretion. And then we have the interstitial cells. Interstitial cells have two main roles. First role, they produce, for example, erythropoietin and calcitriol is produced there. And the other function is to regulate other cells in kidneys. Yes? So the interstitial cells can regulate the function of tubular cells. Yes? So these three functional units and they have different functions, yes? The renal corpus corpuscle, then the tubules, and then the interstitial cells. Okay. Also called, uh, cells. cells are special, are specialized cells of the interstitial. Okay. If you want to produce urine, you have only these three processes that I have already mentioned, yes? So if in the test is the question what pro, how, uh, by what processes you can produce urine, there are only three processes. The first process is the glomerular filtration. Yes, there's a process at the glomerular capillaries. And then you can reabsorb the compounds from the primary urine or you can secrete the compounds to the primary urine, yes? So these three mechanisms are only these three mechanisms can be used to produce urine, yes? About the glomerular filtration. Glomerular filtration is a very simple process. You have a molecular sieve, you have flowing plasma, and you do the filtration, yes? So to do this process, you need to have blood pressure, and then the molecular sieve. So without proper blood pressure, you cannot produce urine, yes? And without the proper molecular sieve, you will produce improper urine with bad composition. This sieve is quite simple. It consists of three parts. The first part is the part of the capillaries, yes? Endothelial cells of capillaries, produce the first part of the sieve. The second part is the basal membrane, yes? You know that the normal basal membrane consists of collagen type 4, then gluco uh, glucose aminoglycans, and of some glycoproteins, yes? So it's the normal basal membrane, as you know, from the first grade. And the third part of this glomerular membrane is our podocytes, the podocytes are special cells of Bowman's capsule. And these cells have, they are processes that we call pedicles. Yes? So the third part are pedicles of podocytes. What do you think is the most important part of the molecular sieve? Yes, and why? That's one thing, yes. Yes, for in the basal membrane, the pores are the, are the smallest, yes. And they have also the negative charge, so this is the place where um, the pores are smallest, yes. Here in the capillary endothelium, the pores are, I think, about 100 micro meters, and here are 100 times smaller, yes? So the most important part is the basal membrane, yes? And what you have mentioned, there are the glucosaminoglycans that are important for glucosaminoglycans have negative charge, so they can repeal compounds with negative charge, and for example, our plasma proteins have negative charge, yes? Under physiological blood pH, all our blood proteins are anions. 
If you have basal membrane with negative charge, negative charge of proteins, they cannot cross the membrane, the proteins. Yes? So through the glomerular membrane can pass only compounds that have mole uh, molecular weight lower than 5,000 and without significant charge, yes? One protein is precisely at the border, yes, that's albumin. Albumin has molecular weight approximately this and it do not cross, does not cross through the membrane only for there is the negative charge. If you lose the negative charge, albumin will go to urine. Yes? This state we call albumin urea. You have albumin in urine and it's the first sign of almost all kidney problems. Yes? For you know, when you want to do the urine examination, the basic urine examination consists of the measurement of proteins in urine. And if you will measure the protein urea, it means proteins in urine, in a healthy individual, you can know that it will be albumin. For albumin is the first sign. Yes, it's the smallest plasma protein and if you do something with the glomerular membrane, it will go through, yes? Other proteins, for example, gamma globulins, can go through the molecular sieve only when there is a severe impairment, yes? So albumin is very vulnerable to pass to the urine. Every day we produce about 160 to 180 liters of primary urine. Yes, primary urine is the product of the glomerular filtration. In some books you have this value expressed in different values. Somewhere you will read 160 to 180 liters. In other books you will read 2 milliliters per second and in the others 200, 120 milliliters per minute. Yes? I'm afraid that you have to remember all values, yes? Or if you know this value, you can calculate the other values, yes? If you know that one minute has 60 seconds and that in one hour we have 60 minutes and in one day we have 24 hours, yes? then you can calculate it. For you as a doctor, it's most important this value, two milliliters per second for this value or the classification of kidney impairment is done by this value, yes? Normal glomerular filtration is 1.2 milliliters per second to two milliliters per second. If you have lower value than 1.2 milliliters per second, the patient has the kidney failure type 1 or kidney impairment type 1, yes? And if the patient has lower than 0 0.3, it's the most severe kidney impairment. So the primary urine is the filtrate of the plasma. It has the same composition as plasma, with one exception. In plasma you have proteins, in primary urine there are no proteins. Or it's better to say that almost no proteins, for there are some small plasma proteins, these two, alpha-2 and beta-2 microglobulin, that are normally in primary urine. These two proteins are smaller than albumin, so they can go through the membrane, yes? But their value in plasma is very, very low, yes? You know that we have 35 to 50 grams of albumin in liter. These values are lower than one, yes? These proteins, all of them are resorbed in tubules, yes? So normally we excrete only very, very small amount of proteins, yes?
how small amount healthy in you individual excrete less than 0 0.15 grams of proteins per day yes so lower than 0 0.15 grams this is absolutely normal if you have higher value than this we call that state protein urea yes is the pathological presence of proteins in urine more than 0 0.15 grams per day, yes? Do you think that there are some situations when even all of us can have protein urea? Even if we are healthy? When you eat too much? What? When you eat too much protein? If you eat too much proteins, you know that in the digestive tract, you will degrade it, it to amino acids, and the amino acids will be burned in the body. And they can be stored in fatty acids, for example, the energy, yes? So if you have high blood pressure, high blood pressure is very harmful to kidneys. Yes, for if you have higher blood pressure, pressure than normal, the molecular sieve has to work with higher pressure than normal. Yes, and there are very often ruptures in the glomerular membrane. So that's true. Hypertension is connected with proteinuria. Yes, but if you do not have hypertension, you have nothing, you are healthy, and you will do something, and you will have proteinuria next day. You said after training. That can be also. It's true that it's after sport activity. Yes, for example, marathon runners that they have protein urea in 100 cases. Yes, there are three causes for it. <clears throat> the first cause is this: they have normal kidneys, but they have some extra renal causes for. Uh, protein urea for during sport activity especially during running you destroy your red, red blood cells in feet yes you you have slightly hemolysis and hemoglobin can go through the membrane yes the same during sport activity you release some amount of myoglobin from your myocytes Myoglobin is four times smaller than hemoglobin, so if hemoglobin can cross, myoglobin can also cross. So these two causes why marathon runners have proteinuria, and the last cause is, you know, during running, you do small damage to kidneys also, yes? So after running, the glomerular membrane do not, it's not, does not work properly. Yes, or in general the kidneys. You can have also slide he, uh, hematuria, small presence of erythrocytes after running. Yes. So when you want to measure the urine, the proteins in urine, you have to say to the patient to do no sport activity at least one or two days before. Yes. For after sport activity, you can have proteins even if there is no problem. Yes. And the basic examination cannot distinguish between myoglobin and hemoglobin, yet it only measures the proteins in urine. <clears throat> but if you have problem, the majority of protein ureas is connected with a glomerular impairment, yes? We have two basic types of protein urea. One we call non-selective protein urea, the second is selective protein urea. The selective protein urea is quite simply. Everything is correct, only you lose the charge. Yes, there is a loss of charge. So the proteins that are at the border, they are small, but they have negative charge. Now they can go through, yes? So the synonymous for selective protein urea is albumin urea, yes? We do not know how. This disease is very typical for especially small children that are younger than 10 years old. They are normal, healthy, 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 and 
in one day they can excrete 20 grams of albumin from nothing. Yes, everything is correct, correct, correct. And now we do not know why. The glomerular membranes lose their charge and they begin to have edema for they lose albumin. And they can lose 20 grams of albumin per day. Very often after three or four weeks, everything is correct. Yes, so you have to overcome this period of three or four weeks. Yes, we do not know absolutely why. Yes, there are some theories that some viruses can do this. Other theories said that some waste products from or some pollutants from the environment, but we do not know. Is the what? Is the it's called something, but how? Not, oh, when I yesterday had a lecture with Czech students, I also tried to remember, but I forget to look at it. Oh, I, can, I will look at it during the break. It's in pathology, it's written. I will look at it during the break, yes. This you cannot find in adults, yes. In adults, you will find this. There is some impairment of the glomerular membrane due to some mechanical problem, that's for example, hypertension, or <clears throat> you have there some inflammation, yes, of the glomerular membrane. So you destroy the structure of the glomerular membrane. It means all proteins can go through. And if the impairment is more severe, also our cells can go through. Thrombocytes you cannot see, but erythrocytes you can see, yes? So then we have hematuria. Yes, proteinuria connected with hematuria. That's typical for non-selective proteinuria. That is very often connected with hematuria. So that was the glomerular filtration. Very simple process, you need blood pressure and you need to have the molecular C with negative charge. Yes? And 20% of plasma is filtered to the tubules and we call it primary urine. Now the primary urine enters tubules. Tubular cells are very, very sophisticated laboratory, yes? They can analyze the urine. They also can analyze the composition of the plasma. And according to this, they can resorb some compounds or they can secrete some compounds. If you want to transport compounds through membranes, you know that we have two possibilities to have the passive process or the active process. And for we need to transport glucose, amino acids, ions, so compounds that have charge or they are polar, so you need to have active transport. So tubular cells have plenty of transporters that need ATP. It means they have huge energy demands and they have plenty of mitochondria. yes? So tubular cells are the cells that consume the majority of energy in the kidneys. <clears throat> and not only the cells itself can analyze the urine, also there are plenty of hormones that can regulate how the tubular cells works, yes? The key hormones are aldosterone that keep the balance of sodium and potassium, then the hormones that regulate calcium phosphate balance, it means parathyroid hormone, calcitriol and calcitonin. And antidiuretic hormone that regulates the osmolarity. Yes, so the movement of pure water in the kidneys. And all these hormones work in tubules. Yes, there is no hormone that regulates the glomerular filtration. Yes. Proximal cubal. The proximal cubal is the site of obligatory resorption. It means hormone-independent resorption. 
you know, every day we produce 160 liters of urine. How many liters of water we have in body? Water in body. Mm -hmm. We have 60%, so if you have 70 kilograms, we have 42 liters, yes? So in our body, we have 42 liters, and every day we produce 160 liters of primary urine. So without resorption, you will lose your own water in six hours, yes? So this you cannot do. It means that the majority of plasma urine has to be reabsorbed, yes? And proximal tubule is the place that does the majority of this resorption, yes? So in glomerular filtration you produce 160 liters of primary urine and 70% of that you will reabsorb in the first tubule, in the proximal tubule, yes? So you can say that it's a bit stupid process. You produce plenty and then the majority you have to reabsorb, yes? The important thing is that this tubule can reabsorb only some compounds, yes? And for example, the waste products remain in the urine. So in the proximal tubule, without any hormone, you reabsorb 70% of water, majority of all ions, of sodium, potassium, bicarbonates, calcium, phosphate, yes? All glucose, all amino acids, all proteins are reabsorbed there, yes? What about uh, fatty acids? Are they also reabsorbed in proximal tubule? Why not? And why? To what? <coughs> to albumin. Yes? So if albumin is not in primary urine, fatty acids also not. Yes? Some small amount of fatty acids, of course, is there. Yes, especially those with short charge, uh, with short chain. And they are, they are also reabsorbed there in proximal tubule. What is important for you to know is that these three compounds, it means glucose and other sugars, Amino acids and proteins are all resorbed with secondary active process. These transporters you already know from digestive tract. So, glucose is reabsorbed by what? By what transporter? Yes. Sodium glucose transport, transporter number two here. In small intestine, it was number one. For amino acids, we have six different transporters according to the character of the side chain of the fatty, of the amino acid, and the same transporters are in kidneys and in small intestine, absolutely the same, yes? Proteins are resorbed by pinocytosis, yes? You should know precisely one process of resorption, and that's the process of resorption of bicarbonate, yes? For you know, kidneys play a very important role in acid-base balance, and one of these processes is the resorption of bicarbonate. For you know that bicarbonate is the most important plasma buffer, yes? So, we need to reabsorb all bicarbonate from primary urine, yes? to keep the acid-base balance. So, the process is quite simple. So here we have blood. Here we have proximal tubal cell. And here we have urine. And what we now want is 
to reabsorb bicarbonate from urine to the plasma. You know that bicarbonate has a charge and compounds with a charge cannot cross the membrane simple, yes? One possibility is to have some special transporter and to use ATP or, for example, sodium to transport bicarbonate to the cell. But for bicarbonate resorption, the mechanism is different. The first stage is that to urine, you secrete proton, yes? And to keep the balance, you need to resorb other cation, and that's the sodium. So the first step is secretion of proteins and resorption of sodium. This transporter is called an AH exchanger or NAH transporter. And it's localized only in the proximal tubule, yes? It's a typical secondary active transport for this sodium has to be then transported outside the cell by the NAK AT base. So now you have in the urine bicarbonate plus hydrogen proton. These two compounds can combine together and they can produce, how's called this acid? Carbonic acid. And this carbonic acid is destroyed to two compounds, to water and to carbon dioxide, yes? You know that this process is normally very, very, very slow, yes? You can make it faster, for example, by sunlight, but that unfortunately our kidneys cannot do. So in kidneys we have enzyme that accelerate this process. Yes. This enzyme is bound to the apical membrane of the tubular cell in the proximal tubule. Yes. So in the membrane you need to have two things, NaH exchanger and carbonic anhydrase. Carbon dioxide can diffuse freely into the cell and water can go through How can water move through membranes? It can follow ions. It can follow ions. Passively. It can go passively if you have there some channel for water. And channels for water in membrane are called aquaporines. Yes? So carbon dioxide moved to the cell by passive diffusion, water by facilitated diffusion by aquaporines, yes? And in the tubular cell, you do the reverse process. So you let combine carbon dioxide plus water, you produce carbonic acid, carbonic acid dissociate to hydrogen proton and bicarbonate. So here you close the cycle, yes? You secrete proton and at the end you gain the proton, yes? And then this bicarbonate 
and the basolateral membrane, you transport to the blood plasma. And to keep the balance, you have to transport some other anion from plasma to the cell in prox of proximal tubule. What anion you will transport? Chloride. Chloride, and this transporter is called It's called an ion exchanger, yes? This transporter you have to know. You spoke about it in the blood, yes? For this, the same transporter is important for the uh, movement of bicarbonate in red blood cells. About the same transporter you spoke when you, uh, in stomach, when you spoke about stomach, for it's important for the production of gastric juice. So now it's the third place where we spoke about it. And it's the, still the same transporter. Yes, an ion exchanger. It moves bicarbonate in one direction and in the other direction it moves chlorides. Yes? Can you repeat where two other places is? This That's <clears throat> I think that it's almost in all cells, but where you have to know is the red blood cells. There is important for the transport of bicarbonate in plasma or in blood in general. Then it's important for the production of gastric juice. Yes? So in stomach. Yes? And the fourth place is pancreas, for the pancreatic juice, yes? The processes in pancreas and stomach are opposite, yes? In stomach, you want to secrete this. In pancreas, you want to secrete the bicarbonate, yes? Uh, how is called this process? It means the transport of bicarbonate and the, then the reaction with carbonic acid. Did you know? You spoke about it during the blood. Hamburgers. Yes, Hamburgers or Hamburgers effect. And the same we call it here in kidneys. Yes? Hamburgers or Ambrigers? I do not know what's correct, yes? Professor Rokita said that it's Ambriger. So this process you have to know, yes? In general, you can say, for here you see that this is cycle, then in general you can say that sodium moves together with bicarbonate, yes? So at the end of this process, you resort bicarbonate and then the sodium, yes? And therefore, in the books you can read that sodium is the force for resorption of bicarbonate. It's true, but there is no direct transporter, sodium plus bicarbonate, yes? So that's a very favorite question, yes? When you say that sodium gives energy to the transport of bicarbonate, so they will ask you or there is some exchanger. For example, sodium bicarbonate exchanger. Yes? And there's no this exchanger. Yes? Sodium gives energy to transport of hydrogen protein. This process, keep in mind till the next week, at least for next week, we have lecture about the acid-base balance. And this is the one role of kidneys in acid-base balance. Resorption of bicarbonate. The loop of Henle. So, what do you know about the Henle's loop? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Yes, so the handless loop consists of two limbs. He has the descending limb and the ascending limb, or ascending part and descending part. What's typical for these two limbs? One is for mm -hmm. the Yes, so the descending limb is permeable to water, water and, and urea also. And the ascending limb is permeable to the ions. Or it's better to say that as in the ascending limb we have transporters for ions. Yes? In the, descending, in the ascending limb we have this co-transporter. Yes? So, unspecific transporter for sodium, potassium, and chlorides. That's in the ascending limb. Yes? In the descending limb, you have aquaporines, so the water can go through. Yes? What's the function of Henle's loop? In Henle's loop, you resorb further 20% of water and ions. Yes? So in proximal tubule it was 70% of water and here we resorb other 20%. Yes? So after handless loop you have only 10%. It means about 16-18 liters yes, of urine. That's one important function. This function is done by this, that you have their ion transport, um, ion transporter and the possibility how to transport water. Other function of Henle's loop is to produce the hypertonic or hyperosmolar environment in kidneys medulla. And this hyperosmolar environment is used then by other part of tubules, by the collecting duct, to resorb even more water. Yes? So you can say that in general, handless loop resorb 20% itself and then it helps to reabsorb other 9%. Yes? So altogether it resorbs 29%. Yes? For every date we produce about 1.5 liters of urine. Yes? So only 1% of the primary urine we produce. Yes? So 70% in proximal tubule, 20% in handless loop in cell itself, and then this enables resorption of other 9%. And how do handless loop produce the hyperosmolar environment? Pump sodium into the interstitial. And in the ascending part when all the ions get Mm -hmm. And why these ions do not move with the water? For if you, the water can go only when they are the ions, yes? So what's the principle of the countercurrent multiplication system? You have urea, I think, that's secreted in the collecting duct into the interstitial movement at all. That makes that's true, there is also some role of the, of, the urea, of the urea. But itself, if you look, do you spoke about it in physiology or not? For yesterday the Czech student said me that not, yeah. that they skip it. Yes. Urea is one uh, one reason. The other reason is the proper arrangement of the countercurrent system. For if you know, oh, if this is a loop, so the water goes this way, and the urine. Yes. And how moves the blood? Yes, in the opposite direction.
So the question is, why the water from handless loop cannot enter the medulla? For it's true that the handless loop is able to reabsorb plenty of water, 20% of water. Hydrostatic pressure? Mm-mm. When the osmolarity decreases and one part it increases and the other part, so... Where can water cross the membrane, the handless loop? Only here. Yes, only here it can cross. And the blood flow goes up, out the medulla. And therefore the water can never go to the medulla, to the top of the handless loop. And the ions, can be transported only here. So it means that here you have height osmolarity for the ions move from the ascending limb to the blood. The ions then move without water, yes? For here the water you cannot resorb. The ions have to move through the, uh, through the medulla at the top, you have the highest concentration of ions for on all these parts you resorb ions. So here we have the osmolarity 100, 1,400 or 1,200. And then the water you resorb here. Yes, so that's the principle why the water cannot go to the medulla itself, yes? So this is one principle of the, of the control current system. The other role about this spoke is the urea, yes? But this is one important mechanism, yes? And I think that the physiologists want you to draw this, yes? So it's For, just, all right. water is moving mainly due to the changes in the osmolarity? Yes, for here, if you look, here you transport the ions, but without water. So the osmolarity here is very, hard, very, very high. The lower in medulla you go, the higher osmolarity you gain for more ions you transport there. So here we have very high osmolarity. And now you have aquaparines and the water can go in the blood. So here we have osmolarity 300, here we have 100, uh, 1,400. So the water will go inside, yes? But this water cannot go here, and also cannot move here, yes? So there's the principle of this counter current system. And this height osmolarity can be then used in uh, the collecting duct, for if the collecting duct has also aquaparines itself, the water can move here in the medulla. Yes? So that's the control current system. So the first part of the control current system is the proper arrangement of the handless loop together with blood vessel. They have different direction of the flow. And then is there the movement of urea. Oh, I forget to tell you this. This cotransporter is a very important cotransporter. You know that we have plenty of patients that have problems with kidneys, yes? Their very big problem is that they accumulate water and ions in their body, yes? If you have improper function of kidneys, you accumulate water and ions. To these patients, you need to give some drugs that increase the production of urine, yes? These drugs we call diuretics. And the most common diuretics that we use in medicine, in medicine are the loop diuretics. It means the diuretics that affect the function of handless loop. And one representative that you should know is furosemide. 
furosemide is widely used, yes, in all countries. It's a very cheap and very effective drug, yes. It's used to increase the diuresis to stop the accumulation of water. We give it not only to patients with kidney impairment, but also with the patients with heart failure, yes. For if you have a heart failure, that the pump cannot produce adequate blood pressure, so we also stop production of water, uh, of urine, so you need to produce more urine, yes? And this furosemide block this transporter, and therefore the resorption of water is less effective, yes? <coughs> So after handless loop, we have distal tubule. Distal tubule, in one word, is the place of action of many hormones, yes? Distal tubule is the place of regulation, yes? Aldosterone acts there. Parathyroid hormone, calcitriol, acts there. The same antidiuretic hormone can do its action not only in collecting duct, but also in the distal tubule, yes? So when proximal tubule was site of obligatory resorption, distal tubule is the place of regulated resorption or secretion. In the distal tubule, you can resorb no water, if you have plenty of water in the body, or you can resorb there 5% of water, if you are missing water. The same range you can find for all ions. If you have plenty of sodium, you will resorb there no sodium. If you are missing sodium, you will resorb the sodium. The same for calcium, potassium, and so on. You should know the action, especially of aldosterone. Yes, aldosterone is the hormone that keeps the balance of sodium and potassium and its action is very, very simple. You know that if you want to resorb sodium, you need to have some mechanism how to transport it outside the cell. This mechanism is NAK ATPase. It means the more molecules of NAK ATPase you will have in the basolateral membrane, the more sodium you can resorb. So if you have aldosterone in blood, it induces the synthesis of NAK ATPase. Yes? It does nothing at the apical membrane. Yes? For a, at the apical membrane, the sodium can move by facilitated diffusion to the cell. For you resorb one cation, the aldosterone has to facilitate the secretion of other cation, yes? And the cation that is excreted is potassium, yes? So normally the aldosterone increases resorption of sodium and excretion of potassium. If you have acidosis in the body, it means a lot of proteins, the function of aldosterone will change and it will still resorb sodium, but it will excrete proteins, yes? So aldosterone is also a hormone that keeps the acid-base balance, yes? And the last part of tubules is collecting duct or a collecting tubule. Collecting tubule is the place that determines the total urine volume and total osmolarity, or the final, final urine volume and final osmolarity. In the collecting tubule, you can move only water. So no ions, yes, no glucose, nothing else, only water. Under normal conditions, cells of, col uh, of collecting tubule are imper impermeable to water. But there is one hormone 
antidiuretic hormone, the synonymous is vasopressin, is the hormone that enables water to move through the cells. The mechanism is very simple. If you have antidiuretic hormone in blood, it binds to the receptor and you incorporate aquaporines to the membrane. Aquaporine type 2. Yes? When you have aquaporines, you have a pore in the membrane for water and the water can move through the cell according to the osmolarity. And for collecting duct moves through the medulla where you have high osmolarity, this uh, water will go from the urine to the interstitium. So antidiuretic hormone does only one thing and incorporates aquaporines to the membrane. Other things are only passive movement of water according to the osmolarity. And this is the only place where you separate the transport of ions and water. Yes, this is important. All other places in kidneys, in all other places you transport ions and water. Only here you can transport the pure water. It means you can change the osmolarity. Yes, so antidiuretic hormone is the hormone that keeps the body osmolarity. So do you have questions to this? If no questions, we will have a break, yes? So the last balance that the kidneys keep is the acid-base balance. Uh, their role in acid-base balance is very complex and we will speak about it next week, yes? So from this lecture, keep in mind only the resorption of bicarbonate, yes? That's one process how kidneys keep the acid-base balance, yes? Kidneys are very important for excretion of waste compounds, yes? They excrete about 60 millimoles of acids per day from the body, especially sulfates and phosphates, yes? You know that they excrete some amount of conjugated bilirubin and then many, many other compounds, yes? For we are medical faculty, plenty of drugs are excreted also by kidneys, yes? So if you have patient with kidney impairment, you need to reduce doses of the drugs, yes? If you give the same dose to the patient with kidney impairment as to the normal patient, you will develop accumulation of that drug in the patient. Yes, for it cannot excrete the drug. And very important is the role of kidneys in excretion of nitrogen waste products. Here we have the four main nitrogen waste products. It means urea, pure ammonia, then creatinine and uric acid. To ammonia, you know that we have two possibilities how to excrete ammonia from the body. The first possibility is to incorporate ammonia to urea or to excrete ammonia itself, yes? This second possibility, it means to excrete only pure ammonia, can be done only in kidneys, yes? And ammonia in urine is a very important buffer for you know that ammonia can bind a hydrogen proton to produce ammonium and H4+, yes? And this is the reason why kidneys can excrete 60, 60 millimoles of acids, yes? For they excrete acid and to buffer the urine that they use ammonia, yes? So they excrete ammonia plus acid 
and the pH of urine is still stable. The ammonia in kidneys is produced mostly from glutamine and glutamate, yes? For you know that glutamine is the transport form of, um, of ammonia through the body. And a few words about creatinine. Uh, creatinine is compound that is produced as a waste product of muscle action, yes? So it's formed in muscles. The more muscles you have, the more creatinine in blood you have, yes? Therefore, we have different physiological values for males and females, and also different values for, for example, bodybuilders, yes? Normally, the values of creatinine should be lower than 110, yes? But if you have bodybuilder, he can have also 150 and everything is normal, yes? In the books, you will read that creatinine is transported to urine only by glomerular filtration, yes? And you will also read that it's neither resorbed nor secreted in tubules, yes? And therefore, we use this creatinine as the marker of glomerular filtration, right? Yes? To calculate glomerular filtration, we use creatinine. But then in clinical medicine, you will learn that it's not true, that it's lie. For under physiological condition, about 98% of creatinine moves by the glomerular filtration and only about 2% by secretion. But if you start to have kidney problems, majority of them are in the glomerular part. The ratio 98 to 2 decreases and more creatinine you secrete to urine. Yes? It's the reaction of kidneys. If you have glomerular problem, you still need to excrete creatinine and therefore you will secrete more creatinine. It means that clearance of creatinine cannot be used to estimate the glomerular filtration if the patient has kidney impairment, yes? So, remember it, learn it, how to calculate it, but then keep in mind that if you have kidney problem, you cannot use it, yes? Kidney is an endocrine organ. I've already said that in kidneys we produce at least three hormones or three names you should know. First is erythropoietin. Erythropoietin is a peptide hormone. It's produced in interstitial cells in kidneys and it's produced when you have hypoxia in renal circulation. Hypoxia means lack of oxygen, low partial pressure of oxygen, yes? This peptide hormone uh, does its action in bone marrow for what its action, how it works, the erythropoietin. It's like a growth factor for the red blood cells. Mm -hmm. production. For the precursors of red blood cells. Yes, for the red blood cells cannot divide. So erythropoietin is the growth factor. Its function is that it inhibits the apoptosis of red blood cells precursors. The lower apoptosis, the more precursors survive and we have more red blood cells. Erythropoietin or the value of erythropoietin is not only increased by the hypoxia, it's regulated also by the sex hormones. Testosterone, male sex hormone, increases the production of erythropoietin. On the other hand, estradiol, female sex hormone, decreases the production of erythropoietin. Yes? So here is the sexual dimorphism, yes? You know that the hematocrite for male is higher than to females, yes? And it's done by the sexual dimorphism action of testosterone and estradiol on erythropoietin secretion. In kidneys, we activate vitamin D. You know that vitamin D is a bit incorrect name. For vitamin D is no vitamin. 
for vitamin D can be produced in our body in quite large amounts. In our skin, we can produce a lot of vitamin D. So now we think that it would be better to call it, for example, hormone D. Yes? But if we keep the name vitamin D, vitamin D itself, it's not active. Yes? To become a potent hormone, you need to do two hydroxylations. First hydroxylation on carbon number 25 is done in liver. And the second hydroxylation done on carbon number one is done in oh is done in kidneys. Is done in kidneys. If you do these two hydroxylations, you gain the potent hormone that's called calcitriol. The chemical name is 125-dihydroxycholecalciferol. Yes? Where, sorry, where are the two other hydroxylations? The first hydroxylation, the 25, um, to where it takes place in liver, first on the first carbon in kidneys. And then this calcitriol can regulate the function of kidneys, resorption of potassium and phosphates in kidneys, in distal tubule. And then the third hormone, you know in kidneys, for we have said at the beginning that kidneys can regulate the hemodynamics, blood pressure and other things. It means that the kidneys are able to produce many vasoactive compounds. It means compounds that can regulate the blood pressure, the action of heart. There are two main systems that regulate it. That's the renin, angiotens, and aldosterone as the system for vasoconstriction, and then the calicrane kinin system for vasodilatation. Yes? Both these systems are affected in kidneys. Yes? You should know uh, this system, yes, the metabolism of calicrine kinin system is quite complicated, so that you do not have to know. So the role of kidneys in renin, angiotens, and aldosterone system is simple. For in the yuxtaglomeral apparatus, you produce this molecule. You produce renin when you produce renin. Under what conditions? That's true, and how the kidney can see I have low blood pressure. That's one thing, there are some different arterioles can regulate it. Yes, so the main factor is the flow in the proximal tubule and in distal tubule. In these two tubules, these two tubules, when they analyze the urine, they see the blood flow, the concentration of sodium, they will give the signals to produce renin. Yes? Renin is enzyme that can do proteolysis of one plasma protein that's called angiotensinogen. Renin takes three amino acids from an chain, an end. You gain molecule that's called angiotensin number one, and to gain the potent molecule, you need to have action of this enzyme that's called yes, angiotensin converting enzyme. This enzyme is localized on endothelial cells, especially high concentration you have in lungs. Angiotensin converting enzyme removes other two amino acids from an end and you gain the angiotensin type 2. And this angiotensin type 2 has about three receptors. The first, most important for the hemodynamics, is the receptor type 1, AT1 receptor. 
And here you see what actions the angiotensin 2 has. Yes? It regulates the kidney function, it reabsorbs more sodium and more water, it does vasoconstriction in circulation, in hypothalamus it induces thirst, and it also regulates the function of our heart. And the last function is to complete the whole axis, it means renin, angiotensin, aldosterone axis. In suprarenal gland, AT1 receptor increases the production of one steroid hormone of aldosterone. And aldosterone has similar action as angiotensin, so it increases the resorption of sodium and also it modulates the blood pressure. Mm -hmm. So I cannot sit here. Good. It's good. And what's missing on this scheme is that renin itself has its receptors, renin receptors. They were discovered, I think, in year 2007, something like that. Now we have antagonists of these receptors, as for example, aliskiren, and they are now used in medicine also. Yes, but they are quite expensive, so therefore we use other ways how to inhibit this axis. Yes, but in next five years they will be cheaper, so you can use also the aliskiren. So if you have in the test that renin is hormone, it's true, and also that renin is enzyme. Both are true, yes? But it's true that in the books you can read that renin is only enzyme, for they have old knowledge. And the last is the role of kidneys in intermediary metabolism. You saw that in many places in kidneys you need energy, yes? You know that in kidneys we have two types of circulation. One that's called functional circulation that's important for the urine production. And then we have the other type of circulation that's important for nutrition, yes? You know kidneys consume a lot of energy, yes? and they eat almost everything, yes? There are only slight preferences. The majority of ATP is used in the cortex. The cortical cells have plenty of oxygen, so they can use everything. They can use fatty acids, amino acids, lactate, glucose, yes? The cells in medulla have one problem, for in the medulla you have lower concentration of oxygen, they have slight hypoxia there. So if you are cell in medulla, what nutrient you will choose? Lactate. For lactate and fatty acids you need a lot of oxygen. You take glucose, yes? For, for the first ATP from glucose, you do not need oxygen. From fatty acid, you cannot release any ATP without oxygen. Yes? The same for pyruvate. Yes, for pyruvate, you release only one GTP in Krebs cycle. Yes? So the slight preference is that the cortical cells can use almost everything, but they prefer fatty acids and lactate during starvation ketone bodies, and cells in medulla, they prefer glucose, yes? For they are missing the oxygen. <coughs> Kidneys play important role in gluconeogenesis. You know that about 10 to 15 percent of, of all glucose in glu uh, during starvation is produced in kidneys. Yes, if you have kidney impairment together with starvation, the patients can develop hypoglycemia, yes? 
of course that liver problems are more severe causes of hypoglycemia, but only kidney problems can do it also during starvation. And then in kidneys, we have very, very intense metabolism of amino acids. Yes, almost all amino acids are somehow changed or can be somehow changed in kidneys. Yes, but if we should choose one amino acid with the most intense metabolism in kidneys, that's the glutamine glutamine. You know that glutamine is, has many roles in our body, yes? The majority of glutamine is produced especially in our muscle cells and especially from the branch chain amino acids. Other important place for glutamine production is our brain and then our lungs, yes? The main role is to remove the ammonia, the toxic ammonia, on the places where you produce ammonia. Yes. So during the degradation of uh, branching amino acids, you gain ammonia. So you need to remove it. In brain, you know that we have plenty of neurotransmitters that have ammonia itself. Yes. So you need to remove the ammonia. Yes. But glutamine has other important metabolic function and you know that ammonia itself is used in some synthetic reactions. In what reactions? In the production of nitrogen bases especially, yes? In the production of purines and pyrimidines. And this function is the cause why glutamine is used as an energy source, especially for the cells with rapid turnover, yes? For the cells that divide quite fast, for these cells need energy, and glutamine, when you remove ammonia, you have alpha-ketoglutarate that can go to the Krebs cycle, and also these cells need to have nitrogen bases, and gl gl glutamine is a precursor for them. And there are three main uh, cells with rapid turnover, tubular cells in kidneys, enterocytes, and our cells of immune system. So these are the major sites of glutamine uptake. So the metabolism of glutamine in kidneys is simple. Kidney cell, the tubular cell takes glutamine from the blood and it removes the ammonia from it. The removal of ammonia, the ammonia can be used in the synthesis for nitrogen basis, or the unused nitrogen can be excreted to urine, yes? So for ammonia in urine is not toxic, for it will be excreted. And the rest of glutamine, it means the carbon chain, is used in the metabolism as the fuel, yes? So it can be oxidized or during starvation, it can be source of glucose. So one role is fuel. It can be used as a donor of nitrogen to nitrogen basis, and the rest can be excreted to urine. Yes? If you have alkalosis in the body, it means you have a lot of bases. You don't want to produce the ammonia that's other base. So if you have alkalosis, you take this ammonia and you build it in alanine. And alanine then moves to the liver to produce urea. <coughs> yes? So you can say, we will speak it about it uh, next week that during alkalosis, kidneys take glutamine and they produce ammonia from it, yes? For from ammonia, you cannot release the ammonia so simple. So that's everything. Yes, calicrane is vasodilatation. Dilatation. Dilatation. 
Before we end, you know, next week you have practical training from biochemistry about urine examination. So what you have to do? <coughs> that's the truth, that's very important. So two persons from every group has to drink and then they should not go to the toilet for at the beginning of the practical training we will take their urine. That's important, yes. And no sports facility. That's important, what else? You should take the lab coat. Very effective is sometimes also calculator. Then the blank paper. And then the last thing is to read it in advance, yes? So in Vyuka you have notes what you should know, yes? So it's the next week. The presentation you have in Vyuka, yes, I put it there this morning. And one other thing, tomorrow we have the lecture about ions, about water and ions balance in the body. So if you can, please look at this a bit. And then last year we have the lecture about the chemical composition of blood plasma. So these two lectures, the blood plasma composition and the lecture tomorrow will be a bit similar, yes? So if you look at it, it will be simpler for you.